repeat the non-conformist oath. I promise to be different. I promise to be different. I promise to be unique. I promise to be unique. I promise not to repeat things other people say. Welcome back to Positive Blatherings with Fitz. That's me, Fitz. And uh, it's one of those things where it, it started out as a daily show, and then it, it kind of went to a weekly show, and then it was a monthly show, and now it seems like it's a quarterly show, <laughs> or it's a whenever I have to have time to do it show, or if I have an opportunity to speak to someone very special like I do today, Chris Wilmot joining me in studio. And uh, I've known Chris for quite a few years now in the in the film community and uh and now in the sobriety community yes and i'm honored to be here i appreciate it scott thanks for having me i'm glad you're here for for a number of reasons and one of them is first of all you've you've been um whether you know it or not you've been kind of a mentor to me over the over the last few years um when we were putting together bottom feeders and um and and as well as in in sobriety I've looked up to you and, you know, seen your accomplishments and, and all that kind of stuff. And so today was a perfect example where I wasn't feeling it. I wasn't, you know, this is positive blatherings, but I wasn't feeling very positive. I was kind of like, uh, I don't know if I could do this. I don't want to be, I don't want to be fake. You know, <laughs> I don't want to be in inauthentic. Is that a word? Yes, I would um, say so. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, no, I've got to, I've got to go through with this. You know, we've been talking about doing this for a long time. And uh, I'm like, no, I'm not going to call and reschedule. I'm not going to. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to force myself to do it. And you come, you come walking in in this great mood, and I'm like, well, there you go. This is a perfect thing. Well, yeah, I, you know, I have, I've done some radio before, not a lot, and uh, certainly when I was in politics, I did uh, a good portion of television, some TV interviews, but I haven't done anything like this in a long time. And it really, I f the, as soon as I woke up, I was really excited to do it. I felt real good. And you know, I'm semi-retired now. I'm still do producing some films, but I um. I, I don't do it every single day. And so, you know, sometimes my, my time's a little too unstructured. But today I was like, nope, this is a good day. I'm going to see Scott and talk about something I've never talked about publicly before, but certainly would want to do that. So, And is uh, being semi-retired, does that mean like every other day is a Saturday? <laughs> kind of, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's no hump day anymore. I don't know. Maybe that's a Tuesday now. Or I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe never. Um, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm still directing and producing a documentary film, uh, which is taking too long. But I hired a new producer um, who's helping me a lot, and she's great. She's uh, 28 years old and has a lot of energy and, and some good experience. So, starting to pick up pace. In fact, I'm going to be doing that today at two o'clock, uh, doing some editing with the, with Mike and uh, Clara. Mike's my editor, Mike Boaz. So yeah. So, but I, I don't, I don't work every day. I also, my health is not, you know, it's not fantastic. I have severe asthma Yeah. and, um, you know, a few other things I'm, I'm dealing with nothing fatal at the moment, but you know, every day you wake up is a, What's that when they say every day above ground is a good day? And it's true. You know, I, <laughs> my parents unfortunately died young of different diseases, very young. And, um, that was rough. I mean, it's very hard. Luckily, I have a very large family in this area and good siblings and so and good grandparents. And that helped. But um, so I'm 11 years older than my father ever was. And I'm 23 years older than my mother ever wow. was. And so it's uh, I'm every day I wake up. Seriously, I, I'm very grateful and, and grateful to be sober. You know, I, even yeah. all these years later. Yeah. And, and gratitude is one of those states of mind that we strive for or you're supposed to strive for i i try to but it is so easy to not be grateful it is so easy to you know pick this and pick that and say oh this is bad and that's bad and look what happened here and look what happened there and you really have to you really have to kind of shock yourself out of it and be like no no let's look at the good things and and that gratitude will will it will change your day but like, like I, I had to force myself today. I was really struggling earlier, like the whole morning. And I was like, you know, it's, I don't know if you like this. This is how I am. If I get overwhelmed with too much work and I'm in a messy space, like something's disorganized, everything just starts to, to fall apart on me inside. Yeah. 
Or to Internally. someone else, yeah, to someone else, it might be like, oh, well, it's just, you seem fine. Scott seems great, yeah. Yeah, and, and inside, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. like trying to hold it up, you know? We had um, had had someone very graciously donate a whole bunch of old voiceover scripts that um, she said, you know, you could use this, you do demos for people, and this is good to have a nice collection of scripts for people to choose from, which I was like, yeah. She's like, you know, I got a bunch of scripts, can I bring them by? I'm like, yeah, absolutely, bring them by, that's great. And she showed up with seven file boxes <laughs> full. <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> you got, you said a shitload, but I didn't, I didn't know that that much of a shitload. So um, my other studio is <clears throat> is wall to wall boxes of scripts and a table and stuff. Every, and so that has been like just and, and I'm trying to get a hold of a of a file cabinet. And I'm like, uh, 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 but that's that's the whole thing. It's like these little tiny things that happen that could be insignificant. But to some people, it's it's huge and it can ruin your day. Right. You know, and that's. So thank you for coming. <laughs> sure, <laughs> because because I'm gonna I'm gonna snap myself out of it. But you you mentioned you mentioned your family, and I know that uh, I mean I know kind of on the surface, but the Wilmot family is 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 a big family in Rochester and and very successful family. Is, is that right? Like you're yeah. connected to yeah. the, the Wilmerite uh, properties yep. and 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 the people in politics, which you were in, yeah, and my, stuff like that. My granddad and his brothers, um, and the wives that put up with those guys, those Irishmen. They, uh, my granddad <laughs> started uh, Page Airways with a guy named Elmer Page, which turned into a very large company, which was sold in 1981. And then Wilmerite is the one people know. So Wilmerite started as post-war. Um, GI housing, really just small little uh, Cape Cods and ranch houses in Henrietta and parts of the city. And that turned into little tiny strip plazas like Suburban Plaza in Henrietta. Uh, I think there was one called Dewey Latta. And then eventually um, the first mall was Greasetown Mall back in 67, let's say. Uh, Pittsburgh Plaza came before that. My dad was the project manager on uh, those malls and Eastview. So, so my, my granddad was one of these guys. He, uh, was not a college graduate. He's one of these self-made guys. Um, his father died, uh, in that, uh, horrible Spanish flu in 1919, along with his older brother. So my granddad suddenly was the oldest uh, male in the family. And wow. he's, he just took it upon himself to really get out there. And, uh, he became, a um, he managed a playground. That was his first job for a ward boss, a democratic ward boss. And then he then eventually started volunteering or working out at the airport and became the manager of the airport. And, uh, that's how he got into aviation, but he was just one of these amazing guys who, um, he, he just had an instinct for business and just could put it together. And, and I'm, I'm not talking about all his hard work and his brother's hard work and my dad's hard work and my uncle Tom too. Um, and again, all the women that put up with those guys, cause they were, they were, <laughs> they were good men, but they were, you know, they were Irish and they, uh, they knew how to, you know, kick back and party a little bit. And, <laughs> and, um, you know, we, you don't make all that money by being nice all the time. So, sure. however, my, both my grandfathers were very successful and they treated me like gold. Um, and you know, uh, that's where I get a lot of my inspiration from is especially my grandfathers and, uh, I, and they're also both my grandfathers were involved in politics. My, my mother's father in Los Angeles, he was a city councilman and a mayor, not a mayor of Los Angeles, but a mayor of a small city in LA surrounded by LA called San Fernando, the city of San Fernando. And then my, 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 the one who's well known around here that the cancer center is named after James P. Wilmot. He was the, uh, at one, at one point, the treasurer of the Democratic National Committee. So he had guys coming over to his house in Menden, like Hubert Humphrey, Scoop Jackson, who was a senator, um, Bobby Kennedy one time. Wow. So, you know, he knew, he knew those guys and hung out with them and uh, raised money. Uh, for the Democratic National Committee and and wasn't much involved in local politics. But anyway, so uh, my sister Mary and I, we both have been involved in politics and we come by it honestly. And, and you know, literally, it's, it sounds cliche, but around our dinner table growing up, we did talk about politics and current affairs. We were always watching Walter Cronkite or John Chancellor on NBC. And um, so, yeah, so that's, I, you know, I, uh, I, I, I was blessed to be born into a family um, that um, was interested in the larger world and that uh, participated in it. And it, it motivated me to get sober <laughs> when I was 20 years old, uh, thank God. And, um, and, and my life uh, 
was was on an upward spiral ever since uh, the first day I got sober. I, I, I just and I was lucky. I was so young. I think that was the key was that I I crashed and burned quickly as as a drunk. Yeah, yeah. And um and nobody you know nobody ever dreams of being a drunk. I I took my first drink when I was probably fourteen and loved it too much. And by the time I was twenty, I went to Clifton Springs for thirty days, and it it totally changed my life. And and it was my father and his brother Bill. That encouraged me strongly and got me into that. And my dad was an alcoholic. So, I mean, it's it, it says something to me that somebody who struggles so much with drinking himself saw that I had potential and that I really needed to get a handle on the drinking and and, uh, and the marijuana used to. And so November 2nd, 82, that was the last time I ever used anything. And um, 40 years later, here I am. So that's amazing. It's and and. In did you have? I mean, this is probably a ridiculous question, but how have the ups and downs been over the years as far as any desire to use um, those, you know, urges and the peaks and valleys of life in general just causing you to say, oh man, I totally could do a drink right now? Yeah, I'll tell you, three months into my sobriety, I was working for my uncle Paul. He used to own some. Uh, uh, Lenahan Hallmark stores locally at the malls, Marketplace in Eastview. And I was working at Marketplace and I was just doing the cash register and stocking the shelves. And it was, you know, I was, I was, I just turned 21 and I was a little bored and restless. And I remember leaving work that day, one day, and I, I said, okay, I'm going to get some Miller ponies. They used to sell eight packs of these little Miller bottles. And there was a 7 Eleven on West Henrietta Road near the, near the mall. And I said, I, I just can't handle it. So I drove and I, then I said to myself, I, I, the, the AA kicked in and the, and the treatment I went to. And I said to myself, buy yourself a few minutes, drive over that, you know, that big hill on West Henrietta from Calkins over to Lehigh if yeah. you're going south. Yep. And I said, just drive over that hill and see if you feel a little bit better. And then that means I was past the 7-Eleven. Not that there wouldn't be other opportunities to buy alcohol that day, but, but just, just buying myself two, three minutes. I just was the desire left me. And that was the closest I ever came to a relapse to, to just, you know, throwing it all away. And it's not that in 40 years, I've never thought about, you know, oh, well, look at all the, you know, the years I have behind me in sobriety. I guess I could have a glass of wine or a beer. Right. Uh, but but I, I know that road. I, I <laughs> you know, I did a lot of drinking in five years. I mean, a lifetime worth of drinking. So, um, no, I never slipped. Thank, thank God. And, and I'm not a, I'm not an overly spiritual person. I'm not an overly religious person. I was brought up Catholic. I had a lot of trouble in AA at first with the spirituality stuff. I really yeah. did. And I didn't like all the sayings like, you know, have an attitude of gratitude or watch that stinking thinking. I hated that stuff. <laughs> I really, I hated it. But you know what? They said, do 40 meetings in 40 days. Yeah. I didn't quite get to 40 day, meetings in 40 days, but I probably got over 30 and I got a sponsor. And I suddenly found I have two guys from high school that I didn't know were sober. I suddenly saw in meetings and we, there was a gang of us that started hanging out. We were all sober. We started playing Trivial Pursuit in the 80s. That was a big thing. And, um, you know, going to diners and just not going to bars, you know. Yeah. And, and I never liked bars much anyways. I used to drink more outside of bars. But um, you know, they say you have to change people, places and things. And it's true. And I kept my, you know, my my old drinking friends and drugging friends. They I didn't banish them, but I, I hung out with them less. And many of them went down some bad roads with cocaine and I luckily didn't do all that, but, um, but the alcohol was enough. It was, it was disastrous for me. So um, I couldn't have done all the jobs, two college degrees, being an elected official. None of that ever would have happened without sobriety. So. Yeah. And what, what did you go to college for? Pardon me. <laughs> I've been fortunate that I've used my major and my minor in, in, in my careers my several careers, I suppose. I was a um, poli sci minor and I was a com journalism major. Oh, okay. So I, I got my associates from MCC, which for me was a big deal because I did lousy in high school because I couldn't stay sober. I was I barely graduated on time. So getting an associate's at MCC, I did go to Syracuse for a while, Syracuse University. But then my dad died in four days into my second semester and my mother had already died when I was in high school. It became a difficult time in our family. So I was back and forth on the throughway all the time between Rochester and Syracuse. Syracuse. And I, I didn't love how large Syracuse was. My class sizes were huge there. So I transferred back and I finished up at Fisher and I happened to be living across the street from Fisher so I could walk to college just like I used to walk to high school. My house was six houses away from Sutherland High School. 
So yeah, I, I was able to use um, both my major and minor from college in my political career. And also I, I worked at a television station, Fox th uh, 31 for a while in the eighties uh, as an engineer. And then I, and I've gotten into film back in 2003 and this is my seventh film. So I've been very fortunate that I've been able to exploit in a positive way, the, what I went to school for. And the interesting thing for me is that your, your background, your family, um, that must have been a huge influence on you when you were going through your schooling and trying to figure out what exactly you wanted to do. Because I always found that that's like the hardest thing. Some people, they know I'm going into the family business. I'm, my dad was this. My grandpa was this. And it, it feels like your family business was so varied and was such a, you know, there was so many opportunities for you to go in a lot of different places. Um, you know, what what was the one thing that made you go? I definitely want to do this. Or well, I mean, my uncle Tom, Tom Wilmot, who still runs Wilmerite, he was very kind to me, and he let me try Wilmerite a few times, and it just, it just wasn't me. It wasn't my personality, and I thanked him for the opportunity. But, but ever since I was a little kid, I always, you know, music first, but then you know, TV and film. I mean, I'll be honest, I'm an addict. I mean, I watch a movie every day, mm -hmm. and there's some movies that are so good. <laughs> And then I'll watch them 20, 30 times. I like to memorize the dialogue. My brother and I grew up doing that, you know, challenging each other on Woody Allen dialogue or Albert Brooks was a, a big comic in our house that we loved. And um, and then, you know, later Martin Scorsese and, and his mm -hmm. films. So, you know, I, 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 I'm proud of myself that I had the opportunity to pursue um, what I love, you know, which and, and politics was another thing that I that I've always loved. Um you know, trying to make a difference. You know, there are 335 million people in this country. So any one of us trying to make any positive change, it's going to be very small. Even elected officials, even the big ones at the federal level in Washington, um, even presidents, they're constrained at some level. Mm -hmm. So anything anybody does in the, in the, in the uh, public sphere where they're trying to help somebody, that's the whole point. You, you'll never know really what, what you did. You, you know, I, I helped pass some legislation when I was in the county legislature, but um, I don't know how much I really impacted people's lives, but you know, the fact is I tried, I dedicated my life to doing that or at least part of my life. And now with film, I was term limited out of the legislature. So I, um, I decided to, I called a, an old girlfriend of mine in LA who was working on the X-Files. And I said to her, and we, we became friends after we dated and I said, how do I get my foot in the door in, in film and TV? And she goes, well, I hate it. I'm leaving it. <laughs> she said, but call my cousin, Kevin. He's, he's a producer. Call him. He, I think he's got a project you might be able to you know, work on. And I became an associate producer on a film with Dean Cain, who played uh, uh, Superman in the, in the ABC series, right. Lois and Clark. And yeah. then I think he went on to do, uh, uh, what's that show? Um, uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not or something like that. But anyway, so that was my first film. I was an associate producer, and then I worked my way up. So I did two films in L.A., one in New York City, one in Louisiana, one in South Africa, which was the best film I ever did in terms of quality, um, and then two in Rochester. And so, three, actually, because I, were, I, I was an actor in your film, right. so, <laughs> which was a lot of fun, by the way. Thank you. That was, that was, that was a ball. I uh, love your character in that. <laughs> it was, it was, well, you know what? I, I've played, I've, I've acted in three or four films, and I've always played kind of the bad guy or the guy that is a little suspect. And, so, and, I, and what was amazing about your film is we did it, as you know, we finished filming just as COVID started. We were lucky. I remember we were over at Nazareth in that, in that building, and, and COVID hit two we, weeks later. Maybe. Yeah, we couldn't get any, um, we couldn't get any extras. <laughs> yeah. I know. Because yeah. yeah, once, you know, once my part was over, it, it was easy for, for me to forget that you guys still had a lot of work to do. So, um, but yeah, that was, so that was an early... 20, I guess. Yeah. yeah. We, we wrapped on Friday, March 13th. Wow. Which was like <laughs> the day. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we wrapped. It was not insane. too coincidental there with Friday the 13th. Yeah. <laughs> so, but no, then that was, a. I, I saw the whole film. It was, it was wonderful. It was funny. And um, I love being the professor, the lecherous professor, professor. So, <laughs> but you know, for me and, and Steve, uh, the director and, and writer uh, for that film, th th it was, it was that we had to do it. 
You know, we, we knew that if we put it off and put it off one day, we were going to both be 70 and we're going to be like, we never made a movie and we're going to be angry and get off my lawn, you know? <laughs> and, and, and that's, and that's <clears throat> why, so we had to do it. And there were, you know, it was what, I think we did it for $75,000, which is remarkable. We, you know, I mean, we, <clears throat> we got a lot done, but you could, you could tell that it's a, it's a low budget movie. I mean, you could tell if, if you want to, if you ever uh, are completely bored and you want a good chuckle, read the IMDB reviews. <laughs> You can tell where all our friends are, <laughs> and then you can tell where people watched it and were like, "What the heck was that? I'm never getting that 90 minutes back." But you know what? But but we but did it. it. But it, it's really really good. You did it, and I would encourage anybody. You have to chase your dreams. I mean, it's you know, life. I remember um, there was this movie with Anthony Hopkins once, and one of the best lines from that film was um, he was talking to his father in law, who was quite a bit older than him, and. The father-in-law said to him, he goes, I've seen these young men and they think that death is merely um, a bad rumor, a poor rumor, not to be true. And I remember being a young man, I thought I was invincible, yeah. absolutely invincible. So when you're young, that's when the dreams are vivid and, and real. And it's that's when it's important to listen when you're in your teens and 20s. Because by the time people get in their 30s and 40s, it's not that you can't pursue important things, but you know, our energy starts to dip, you know, I, I remember Just you know, <laughs> when I turned 30, I, you know, around that time, I noticed a little bit of a difference in my energy and I was even in great shape. I was running, I was really athletic, but you know, and then you get 40 and 50, now I'm 61 and my energy is way, way different than when I was in my twenties and thirties. So that's the time is to, to make a mark. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be a career. It could be, you know, if your dream is to have kids and be a good father or mother. That's fantastic. I didn't go the kid route. I went the career route. Yeah. <clears throat> and I don't regret that. It's fine. I have a lot of nephews and nieces and that's wonderful. So, but I, I think um, I'm proud of you guys that you and Steve did that because it would, it's just as easy to, to come up with reasons not to do it and say, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe someday. Well, someday yeah. is like today or tomorrow, you yeah. know? So, yeah. Yeah. And well, and you know, you, you were one of the people that, that we looked up to, that I looked up to as someone who went after stuff and did things, you know, went and did it like uh, hero of the underworld. You guys just did a, You just made a movie. You were like, let's make a movie. And you made a movie. And, yeah, and that was fun. And that was that, that approach to it. And it's a lot of, the, a lot of the advice that I got was, you know, Act like you have the money. Act like it's going it, to, you're making it. It's a thing. And that's really what I did is the whole time I said, I just started putting on the calendar. Here's the dates. This is when we're going to do this. This is when we're going to do that. And it all just sort of happened. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's such a team effort. And, you know, back to Hero of the Underworld for a moment. I mean, that's, there's never a film like that without Tom Malloy. And I met Tom, Tom and I were trying to buy into a studio out in um, Elm Grove. Um, young lion. Yeah. And I don't remember the name of the gentleman who was running it, but um, Alex. Yes. Thank you. And he didn't, you know, he was a nice guy, nice enough, but he didn't seem to want the help. And we, we didn't want to beg him, but we said, Hey, we're here. We have some money. We have, we have some experience. And so then Tom and I uh, said, okay, no, no, no hard feelings. And then we went and made uh hero of the underworld and Tom wrote that and Tom starred in it. I played the abusive boyfriend. So the woman he was after in that movie, um, I, was, I played the abusive boyfriend who Tom eventually punches out. And one time it, we took about seven or eight takes that. And one time he nicked my nose, but it didn't hurt. Thank God. He just barely <laughs> nicked it. But we filmed that um, near next to the Strath Allen in a house there. But the, but the point is, yeah, you have to chase these things. And, you, and you'll find there, you know, even in a place like Rochester, this is not L.A. or New York or Toronto or London, but there are skilled pe people here. You know, Tom Malloy would never live here in a million years except – his children grew up here and he wanted to be a part of his kids' lives. And now he's got a daughter, I think, is high school or after. I think she might even be college age now. I don't know. Um, so he, you know, he said, okay, I'm not going to miss my kids growing up. I could, and he likes LA better. That's where they started out, he and his wife, but his wife is from here. So I give him tons of credit for saying, okay, what am I going to do in Rochester? Oh, what, yeah. what can I do? And how many people would have not done that? 
You know what I mean? Who would have said, I'm not living in Rochester. Oh, yeah. There's no way in hell. And then, he, and then he, you know, he might have been more famous or been more successful, maybe, if he had stayed in L.A., but then he would have missed his children. And, you right. know, he's an integral part of their lives. I, he's a good father. I've, I mean, Kathy and I don't see Tom as much as we used to, but they used to come over and swim at our house, and we used to hang out. So people like Tom Alloy, I mean, he's, I can't believe how much energy he has. He's in his 40s, and you'd think he was about 25. And... um he, he that was a wonderful project um and so yeah um y- you got to you got to say today if today isn't the day tomorrow's the day cuz you can't keep putting stuff off because life starts to you know my mother my mother was 38 when she died but she warned me of this even in her 30s she said watch out it starts to go quicker yeah and now it's 61 wow you know weeks just fly by sometimes oh i know i know i'm talking to my kids so i have um my son is going to be 20 wow uh in a couple of days which is blowing my mind <laughs> and you i think about we started this studio here 5 years ago and i'm like he was 15 my other daughter, who's 16 now, she was 11. And to me, five years ago was like yesterday. It's yeah. like five years ago. But to them, it's a lifetime. They're it like, is. oh, my God, I was 11 years old. That was forever ago. And you're like, it was only five years. It's, and for them, it's like 25 <laughs> or 50% of their life ago. Right. And for right. us, it's like a fraction. Yeah. You know, but it's yeah. it's strange how, the, yeah, the time just you, you, the time just moves right along. And it, it, it becomes more imperative to say, you know, not someday, this bucket list thing, you know, at 61, that becomes a lot more real. But, you know, the thing is, I've, I've done a lot in my life. I'm not I'm not saying I'm some great successor champion of anything, but I've tried a lot of things. And that's, I guess, if I had to say, if I'm proud of anything, I've failed many times, but I've tried a lot. Yeah. And that has made all the difference. So, I, you know, I've said to my wife and, and my close friends, if I died tomorrow or tonight, I don't really have many regrets. I would say that was a life well lived. And again, in my family, 61 is kind of old. You know, my 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 dad's dad was only 68 when he died of cancer. Um, f- fortunately, my mother's parents lived into their mid 80s. So I have some longevity yeah. in my family. I have a great aunt who just died a few years ago. She was a couple months short of 100. Her mother was 98 when she died. So again, yeah. there's spotty longevity, but I'm just glad that you know, I don't have any incurable diseases. I'm 61, and maybe I'll make it a couple more decades. Hopefully, you know, I, I hope so too. <laughs> um, so, apart from from family members, who would you say was your your biggest influence when you were coming up, as far as business or goals or mentorship, anything like that? Well, you know, um, Mario Cuomo, the, uh, Andrew Cuomo's father, the, the man who was governor for three terms in New York State, and before that, he was lieutenant governor under Hugh Carey. He um, I met him in the late 80s and fairly early on, I, um, I I got to work on his, actually his final campaign in 94 and got to know him a bit. And um, I found him to be an amazing speaker. I was, I was fortunate enough to go to the 1984 Democratic National Convention in San Francisco. Um, and that was the one where Walter Mondale was yeah. nominated. Um, I was a Gary Hart worker, but I heard Cuomo's um, keynote address there and it was mesmerizing. And so I became a devotee instantly. And so he was somebody who really motivated me to pursue politics. Um, and again, I had the honor of meeting him a few times and um, I'm trying to think, well, you know, certainly Martin Scorsese, you know, when I look at, when I look at uh, the, the, the film side of my life, it would have to be somebody like Scorsese. My favorite director ever though is not Scorsese and I love him. It's Sidney Lumet mm-hmm. who did landmark films like 12 Angry Men, which I still, every time it's on TV, I have to watch it. Um, he did Fail Safe, an, an amazing nuclear uh, drama um, Dog Day Afternoon, Serpico. Um, my favorite film he did, Network, in 1976, which won a bunch of Oscars. And he also did The Verdict with Paul Newman. And some films. He even did a film with uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. I think it was the last film he ever did, which was called uh, Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. Oh, that's a great movie. It's a terrific film. Albert Finney is in it. Yeah. Um, who, who else? Uh, Ethan Hawke. Tremendous mm-hmm. actors in that. So, you know, that I would have to say he's my favorite all time director. And there's there's many others I love, but I love Sidney Lumet the most. And he was a very low key guy. A lot of people have never even heard of him. But if, if when you start listing his films, you're like, oh, yeah, I mean, Jesus, right. especially in the 70s, he was prolific. And with Al Pacino, he did a bunch of good movies. So, yeah. Was that the 12 Angry Men with uh, Fonda or it was it was the first the one, yeah, one, which I think is the best one. Yeah. Um, and Fonda really and Lumet, good. they consulted on that heavily before they did it. Um, Fonda. Uh, was really a big proponent of that story and uh, hired Lumet, and uh, you know the rest is history. That's that's regarded, 
I would say in many people's uh, book, the top top 40, top 50 films ever. In mine, probably top 10. So, yeah. So, anyways, these, these are people that I looked up to. Um, yeah. That, that just that motivated me, you know. And um, I couldn't believe I got an opportunity to get into film. I mean, this without my friend Mary in California, Mary Estadorian. Um, and I got to go on the set of the X Files. I met David Duchovny, and that was really fun, you know. Yeah, and so. it kind of it, it it really like grabs a hold of you, you know, when you're in that environment. <clears throat> a lot of people would be taken by it, even if they're not interested in film. You know, there's a certain just magic around that whole life. Um, but you, you you know when you do it, when you actually do it, it, it you really. <laughs> You can very easily go, no, this is not what I want to do, because there are certain people that work in and around film who can be very difficult, who, um, you yes. know, you know, the different personalities and things like that. I know that in my experience producing bottom feeders, I was like, I if I could produce every day, if I could just produce, I would be very happy because that was a great experience. But it was insane. Yeah. And this was just a small, you know, low budget film. And I was like, I'm every day I'm pulling my hair out and I'm going nuts, but I'm solving problems. And then the next day I'm like, let's do this again. I'm yeah. like, I don't understand this. How come I had a really horrible day yesterday, but I'm excited about doing it again. I, it's a weird thing. I, I, I've been mostly a producer in my film life and uh, I'm directing this time. I don't think I'll direct again. It's too much for me. Yeah. Um, but producing, producing and directing. Yeah. I'm doing exec produce, produce and directing and the script and the whole thing. All the hats. And, and self-financing. So at least I own 100% of the intellectual property, which right. is good because then I get to choose how to market this thing. Right. And that's, and that's another thing I know that you've learned is it's not just making the movie, which is tough enough, but then how, how do you get it out there? How do you get out that, so people can see it? That's more important. Yeah. <laughs> and people will say all the time, they'll say, oh, there's so many platforms now. And it's true. But there's a lot of content out there. A lot a of lot noise. Of, a lot of, there is. And a lot of people make very good films. And uh, they they, they're never get, they never get seen because it, the competition is fierce. I call the film business the Wild West because the First Amendment protects it. But that's also one of its curses because I, you know, I've been I've been ripped off before in, in the film business. Um, not recently, thank God. But um, it's it's very hard to find ethical distributors and and money people sometimes, especially distributors I find. Yeah. Because a lot of the deals are we will take all the proceeds went until we get made whole for our alleged or real uh, marketing that we do for your film. And right. then you'll get some money. And they, and never, I, they never get made whole. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, right. There's always some way that you, the proceeds are pretty minimal, I find. So so thank God I've got some other investments because if it was just film, I would be in the poorhouse. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough it's a tough thing it i know is. we 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 went with uh indie rights uh they're great people um probably wasn't the best deal ever but it was it was something it got it it got it out there you know on the platforms and i i would go back and do things differently yep. um you know as far as the marketing was concerned but we really we spent all our money on the film so it was kind of like you know, you really have to have a war chest. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, I, you know, I, one of, uh, Hero of the Underworld was made for probably forty, forty-five thousand dollars $45,000. I've done films that are over a million, um, never over two. But, um, you know, the, the, the everybody wants to make the next Blair Witch Project, which was made for peanuts and made zillions of dollars. Right. Uh, another film that people forget that was made for very little money that did very, very well was Easy Rider. That movie was made for under 200,000, I think 300,000. And it, you know, has reaped many millions. Uh, and that was 1969. It was and a long time that, ago. And that was uh, a lot of luck with it. <laughs> yeah. Have you heard the stories about that being made with Dennis Hopper and like, he yeah. was just insane. Yeah. Dennis Hopper, incredibly creative, uh, brilliant actor, but probably not always the easiest to work with. Right. Um, but, um, I read a great review once of Easy Rider where the reviewer said that was the movie that almost bankrupted the Hollywood studio system because then all the studios saw what that kind of film could do and they started trying to do it themselves and they the the efforts were not good. There was a movie with Joe Namath called CC Rider right. which was not very good, you know, and so there were there were there were copycats of Easy Rider but they didn't have this, uh, the people that made that Terry Southern, uh Peter Fonda and and um Dennis Hopper, they they were living that kind of hippie lifestyle and they, they knew the good music and 
Um, some of the other guys weren't quite as cool that tried to copy that. And so anyway, so the seventies was a, a very weird time where um, the studio system almost failed completely. But then people like George Lucas came in, did star Wars and Spielberg yeah. and they, and I don't, I don't necessarily like those films the best. I mean, th- those are great directors, but I like the more um, I like re, uh, re the, the era of realism is my favorite. That's why I like the mid fifties to the mid seventies might be one of my favorite periods. And then again, in the late eighties into the nineties, some very, very good films. I'm not so impressed now with films. I don't like the, the, the superhero films. I don't watch any of them. I just don't, I'm I'm like Martin Scorsese. He said to, to me, it's like going to an amusement park, you know? And so it doesn't mean those aren't well-made films They're super well-made, but I, I don't like the, I call it the simplistic depiction of good and evil. That's that's I I think that's more for kids than that. Well, I mean, it's, it's but people love them. It's based I off a comic book. <laughs> yeah, and I you know I'm one of those guys who didn't grow up loving comic books. I didn't yeah. hate them. I just didn't love them. Yeah. You know? So again, I I know they're well made. It's just not the kind of film I want to see. So yeah, and 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 it's true with um with the with cable and TV and streaming systems and streaming services and whatever, you know, the theater experience has really become. It's like going to see a concert because yes, you could watch a movie. I like seeing films on the big screen, but I'm also not like, I don't have to Yes, but there are some films that when it comes out, you're like, Oh, I have to see that on the big, big screen. Yeah. You know, if it's, if it's an indie drama, you're like, All right, well, it's, it's on the HBO max. So I'll watch <laughs> it there, but it's also in the theater, but eh, you know, um, but I, I'd be interested to see what um, what happens with the uh, with theaters in the next 10, 10 years. Yeah, I mean it's kind of scary. <laughs> Locally, we've seen this with yeah. the Regal Grease Ridge closing and now Regal Henrietta. Yep. Um, we're hoping the Pistol Plaza one opens. I think it's some company called Apple theaters out of Massachusetts. Um, so did Zurich completely get out of the area? No, he still has um, movies ten, I believe. Oh. Yeah, Conrad Zurich, a good man. I like Conrad. Yeah, he 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 put our film Lucky for, that we made in South Africa. He put that um, on his screen for three weeks running in uh, Pittsburgh, and that was, you know, we were indebted to him. He went to Toronto and saw it there. We were in the Toronto Film Festival, and then we became friends. And so, yes, I believe he still owns Movies Ten. And if you haven't been there, um, he rehabbed that and put some recliners in there, and yep. it's a very nice theater. We that's and it's we, affordable for people that can't afford, you know, Regal Eastview or AMC Webster. You know, that's where we um, that's where we had our premiere for bottom feeders. And yeah. because of the pandemic, we had it on all 10 screens <laughs> because only 20 people could be in each theater. <laughs> it's pretty cool, though. <laughs> it was. He, he he was a great guy. He did. I, so I I actually got movies 10 and the the other theater confused. I thought they were the same. So I was I was mistaken. Oh, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and I want to ask you a question. So I'm going to ask you a question. Sure. Because I love bottom feeders. I love being a part of it. Um, will you do another film, do you think? Or is that something in, in the future for I mean, you? It's something that we want to do or yeah. that I want to do. Um, <laughs> it's going to come down to just have to do it. Yeah. Um, I was I was looking at, at doing um, a web series type of thing based on on this studio and, and sort of a, a little storyline. And because I miss that creative process, I miss putting it together and all of that stuff. And it, it really, because I work well as a collaborator and not as a captain, you know, yeah, I'll I, get so far and then something gets in the way. And the next thing, you know, six months has passed and I got nothing done. I, yeah. And that's, that's what I miss when I was just a producer because I worked with some excellent people and, um, there were always people around to solve problems when I ran out of energy, you know, right. and the, the one I worked the hardest on and the most on where I was the, 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 I guess I had the biggest role as a producer and exec producer was our film lucky that we made in South Africa. And, uh, we were, we filmed there for 34 days. That was an amazing experience wow. and met some amazing people, very South Africans, very friendly people. Um, also, we got to hang out one day with wild baboons and we hung out <laughs> one time, a, one time a, a, a giraffe, a wild giraffe wandered onto our set and that was a challenge. And so, you know, it, how that, many that, people can say that? Right? Not many. And that's, that's why it was, I mean, my wife and I, she was my girlfriend then, Kathy, we, she was a producer too. And it was just such a phenomenal experience. And uh, we met, we did a film called um, Revenge for Jolly in New York City. We had some 
A level cast. We had uh, Kristen Wiig and we had Ryan Phillippe and some really good actors. And I met Ryan on the set, and somehow Lucky came up in South Africa. Came up. He goes, "Do you know Jubilani?" <laughs> I said, "Yeah, he was our bodyguard." And he goes, yeah, mine too. So he worked with the same studio in South Africa called Out of Africa Productions. So, and Ryan Philby is somebody who's, I've always admired his acting, especially in that movie Crash. He played a cop in that. It was yeah. great. So he was he was in our film. He played a criminal. And um, so I have a picture with him where he's holding a gun to me because he's a criminal in the film. So, um, but but anyway, you, you, and you meet, so it's not just the, it's not just the crew, which are, which are fantastic in films, fellow producers, whoever, but, but many of the actors, most of the ones I've met have been really good people. I've been fortunate. I haven't met any horribly snotty, you know, snooty actors that didn't want anything to do with me. Um, some one guy I met who was in um, Goodfellas, Kevin Corrigan, who played Ray Liotta's younger brother in that. He, he was crippled. He was in a wheelchair. Yeah. Um, he was in our film uh, Revenge for Jolly. So I tried to talk to him on the set, but he was in character. He was a method actor. Oh. And so I realized quickly, okay. You know, that's cool. You know, let him do his thing and not. And I've learned around famous people, don't, you know, read the signs, you know, read the tea leaves. If somebody needs to be left alone, then that's cool. Maybe they'll talk to you another time, you know. And so uh, anyways, it's been a, it's been a great experience. Like I said, if I if I if I pass tomorrow or tonight, I don't think I have any regrets. I think I would say that was a that was a good life. I was lucky. I was very fortunate to, to have been able to be an elected official and to be in the film business. Very fortunate. And to have a great wife too. So Yeah. Nice <laughs> on the cake, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I I still am kind of in awe of the the way that you've navigated your career and managed to just completely just be like all right, alcohol is done. I don't need that anymore. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people that struggle on a daily basis. I know when I was going to AA and thankfully I'm not one of those people either. I don't, I don't get up in the morning and, and be like, Oh my God, I got to make it to noon. You know, I'm fine. I don't think about it at all ever. Uh, I'm Good just for you. fortunate that way. Yeah. Um, but I know that other people uh, aren't as lucky and so have you ever been a sponsor for somebody? Boy, that's a good question. Maybe many years ago in the 80s, but I don't, I don't really remember now. I probably was. I just don't recall. And I kind of faded out of AA. Again, it, it, it saved my life. So, yeah. But I, I – um, you know, I, I guess I realized there's some hardline AA people and 12-step people that think there's kind of sometimes only one way to do AA. Yeah. And I, I wasn't like – I'm a very individualistic person, and I found that my way, whatever it was, worked for me. Yeah. And I never put anybody down that did it their way where it was a meeting a day or four meetings a week. And, I, and for a while I was like that, but – as the eighties and my career got kind of busy, my life got kind of busy in the late to yeah you know, late eighties, and I I just kind of faded out of it. And there were people that criticized me for that, but that's okay, you know. Um, I, like I said, I was fortunate that my way has worked, not perfectly, but um, and you know when I realized you know alcohol and marijuana, those were kind of the symptoms, but the problem was. Um, I learned some bad things as a kid. I learned some wrong ways to address life and to overcome challenges. And so I've done, I've done uh, psychotherapy too. I've, I've been in therapy and still am to this day. You know, I go yeah. every couple of weeks. And so, you know, in life, don't be too embarrassed to ask for help. There's a, there's a great, what was that movie called with um, Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin are lost in the Alaskan wilderness. Oh, oh, the uh, edge, the edge. Yeah, and and there's yeah, a, a fantastic there's a, movie. The, fa yeah, amazing, tough movie though. But at one point, Anthony Hopkins asked Alec Baldwin, who's a real scoundrel in that film, Alec yeah. Baldwin. But he asked him, you know, why most people die when they're stranded in the wilderness? And Alec Baldwin says, no. He says they die of embarrassment, and it's it's the idea. But we're all the wilderness is here. It's in Rochester. It's in any community anywhere in the world and if if you forget that people will help you um it could be a family member it could be a dear friend um whoever it is a colleague at work but if you forget to reach out and ask for help you're in the wilderness if you if you, if you forget too many times yeah and so fortunately and i didn't always do it often enough or right but i've asked for help enough and some people have come to me when they realized i need help and they say yeah. hey man you know can i help you out but but don't yet yeah, don't be embarrassed or yeah. try not to try to try to overcome the embarrassment to say that person over there they're doing something that that I like that I admire and I'm going to go ask for help or some some advice who knows yeah. you know 
I know um, the old school. The old school way is if you're in therapy, there's something wrong with you, or right. you know, it's a character flaw. Just like addiction is a character flaw, you know, in the old school way of thinking. Suck it up, you know. Just you know, pick yourself up by your by your bootstraps and 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 just sally forth. Right. Um, which which you know maybe some people could have done that, but it's not. <laughs> it doesn't work, and you only have you know uh, willpower is finite. You will run out of willpower, and so I've been a big proponent of definitely getting therapy. Therapy, I say this to this day: therapy saved my life, saved my marriage. I would not be sitting in this studio talking with to you about this if it weren't for therapy. And I believe, just like you say, I believe that people should you should go to a therapist a couple times a year, even if you think everything's okay. Yeah, be, because. Like, you know, they're, they're professionals. I mean, that, a lot of people didn't believe the whole COVID thing. And I, I, I know a lot of people at the URMC at Strong. And I was on a board of directors there in a cancer foundation for a while. And, you know, I say to them, I, I say, you know, if you have a headache, you might take some Advil, you know, if you, or, or Tylenol. If you, if you break your leg, you're going to go to the doctor. These are the same people. <laughs> these researchers that come up with this medication and these vaccines, they're the same people. They're professionals. And so are, so are therapists. That, that's what they go to school for and they get their, their degree. And you have to be licensed in New York State. So, so you know what? Go see a professional. If you need your car, I don't know how to work on a car. I know how to buy one and drive one. <laughs> but I can't. I, I suck. I'm not a mechanic. So I, I go and get some help. So remember, people need to, I think we're getting toward the end, but people need to remember reach out for help because it's there. Somebody's going to say, okay, yeah. And, and that has really benefited me. And, and I, and men need to do this more than women. Women are better at it. Women network better with each other. I think men were supposed to be these strong virile types sometimes that go it on our own. And that, that's a tough road to go. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I completely meant to ask you about your studio and we've, <laughs> <laughs> this is positive blathering. We, we can do so it another we, time. We at, blathered. Yeah, we blathered. Yeah. What, what is the name of your studio? It's called Galaxy West. Galaxy West. And it's in the it's in the uh, northern end of the uh, Genesee Valley Regional Market in Henrietta. So right. it's two buildings behind uh, the King and I restaurant next to Safe Light Class. That's a gorgeous space. Thank you. Thank Such you. And so is this. Uh, this is my first time in your studio, and it's a it's also a gorgeous space. And I think you get a little more business here than I get over there. So I, I need to follow you <laughs> and watch what you do. I think Scott. So. I think we got two different businesses going. Maybe. But I, you know, I I wish you a lot of success in what so what's what's kind of on the horizon for you in the next uh, couple of years or anything? really just finishing my documentary. This we, is the we, Jimi Hendrix documentary. No, this is this is about um it asked the audience the question, should geography be destiny? So it's about K through 12 uh, education segregation that if you live in the city and you're born into a situation that's not your fault. Um, don't you deserve the same opportunities that a kid like me born in Pittsburgh? I didn't choose to be born in Pittsburgh, but I was. Or in Webster or in Gates or Chai yeah. or Greece. These Those communities have better school systems and better opportunities for kids. The city is tough and it's not suburbanites are evil and everybody in the city is great. It's about just creating better opportunities. And that's what the documentary is about. So we're about 95% done with shooting, 70% 70 done with editing, and then someday we'll market it. So Very cool. Coming to a theater near you, I hope, or a television set. Well, if there's anything that I can do to help in any way, please reach out. I'm Thank you. Always uh, happy to work with you and and really enjoyed our conversation. Me too. Though meandering it was, but I got a lot out of it. And like I said... When I was starting this conversation, I was like, kind of not there, and you, I, you, you changed my day. You changed my well, day, and, and you too. Like I said, I woke up really feeling good this morning, better than usual, because I knew I was going to do this. And now you feel worse. <laughs> <laughs> Never on you, man. You're you're an up guy. You make me feel good. So. <laughs> right. Well, so um, how can people find you? Galaxy West, you got a website for that? Yeah. Um, best way really, though, is just um, my email, uh, chriswilmot61 at gmail.com. Send me, send me an email. We're still, we're still tinkering with the website. My, my wife's good at this stuff. I'm not. So we're trying to rehab the website. So, again, chriswilmot61 at gmail.com. Get a hold of me that way. And uh, if you want to rent some space, we'd love to have you. Awesome. Thanks so much. We'll do this again at Anytime. some point. Thank you, Scott, very Take much. Care.
Thank you.